It may cover only 1% of the Earth's surface, but Mexico, with its complex topography and diverse habitats, harbors more than 10% of the world species, including a remarkable assemblage of birds. But as Mexico's population and economy have grown, many of its wild places have disappeared. The country has less than half of its original forest and just 10% of its tropical rainforest. While this transformation has clearly taken a toll on Mexico's birds, understanding its full impact is only possible because of one man's peculiar obsession. The Moore Laboratory of Zoology was started by a fellow named Robert T. Moore. He was a businessman, he was a mountain climber, he was a poet, and he was also an ornithologist. The birds of Mexico were kind of this big undiscovered land of potentially new species, and Moore wanted to be the, the one that uncovered those species. So he hired a, a collector, a fellow named Chester Lamb. Chester Lamb lived in Mexico for 22 years and he collected from really all parts of the country. This is the largest collection of Mexican birds in the world. We have 65,000 specimens sampled from throughout the entire country. And it is here at a small liberal arts college. And so I like to say we have the highest bird to student ratio of any of our peer institutions. I came to the Moore Lab as the curator, so it wasn't too long before we started to talk about how we could understand the change that had happened over the last hundred years on the Mexican landscape. You can't really do that unless you have a baseline to go from, and that's what we have here at the Moore Lab. We have that baseline of what things used to look like. Mexico went through its really intense period of habitat alteration towards the end of the 1950s, the 1960s. That involved cutting down a lot of the big forests, and it also involved government programs to really mechanize agriculture. Most of Chester Lamb's specimens were collected before Mexico became the modern industrial economy it is today. With this one-of-a-kind collection as their guide, John and his colleagues can revisit the places where Lamb worked and find out what has changed. John was telling me that it would be nice to try to find places that have been heavily transformed. And I immediately thought about the Los Tuxtlas region here in Veracruz. Here we are, walking in Lamb's footsteps, here in the foothills of one of the big volcanoes in the Tuxla region, the Volcan San Martin. All around us here, you've got the sounds of the birds of the tropical jungle. But only 5% of the original forest is remaining in this part of Mexico. If you see it like from, from the air, it's like an island completely surrounded by this matrix of agriculture and things like that that have been heavily transformed. All right, Will, you ready? Five June. All right, um, turkey vulture, black vulture, blue ground dove. Oh, did you get a slave rested tinamou? Ruddy ground dove. Bright rumped attila, sulfur bellied flycatcher. White breasted wood wren. Did we cover warblers? No. Rufus crowned warbler? We've only been here for a day or two, but the birds here have changed quite a lot. Um, certain species probably have disappeared, and other species associated with agriculture and cattle have come in. John and his team want their data to be freely available in Mexico and around the world. So they use a citizen science platform called eBird to upload their checklists and photos to an online database. And they're doing the same with Chester Lamb's collection and notebooks. Now, 
scientists and bird lovers alike have access to decades of meticulous observations of Mexico's birds. It's like Chester Lamb had used eBird when he was collecting. It's available for everybody in the world. A lot of birds that are no longer in the regions, we, we can only see the records because they are now on eBird. The Imperial Woodpecker, which is what was the biggest woodpecker in the world, it was an endemic to Mexico and it got extinct in the 60s. But now we can find it on the maps and see where, where they were seen, all, all different regions. Looking at a map of Mexico, you can really get a feel for how extensive Lamb's collections were. They just basically blanket the map. We can't resurvey all of these sites ourselves. Throughout the country, John and Chente are working with groups of local experts called monitors who help the team find and identify all the birds at a site. Here in Los Tuxtlas, we have like this, it's probably one of the best groups that we ever have. Having these guys with, with the project, it makes a, like, a big, big difference. I mean, they, they know the birds, they can identify it and find them, I don't know, 10 minutes before everybody else. Once we leave, they'll be going out to different sites that Lamb collected and making observations, making eBird checklists uh, in a similar way that we're doing here. I really think that uh, long after the project is over, people will keep adding more data to it. So, so it's like it's not going to be over at all. In Veracruz, where most of the original forest had been lost to agriculture, John expected to find different bird species than Chester Lamb did a century ago. But other parts of Mexico have been better protected. This place is kind of a land of giants, as it were. You've got the big trees, big open spaces at high elevation with these meadows, and you've got these huge granite boulders. This is a place that has essentially been protected for the last century by the Mexican government. It never got developed. It never got logged. And so everything you see is basically in place. Chester Lamb came here in the 1920s and he collected throughout the mountain. I mean, you can literally walk in his footsteps. You know that he was walking a specific trail and you're there walking that trail too, seeing birds that are the descendants of the birds that he saw when he was there. And um, those are really special moments that can almost take you back in time. I think the story of this place is really how much has stayed the same. We've found almost all the same species that Lamb found when he was here, just with a few very interesting exceptions. One of those exceptions is a bird called the rock wren. You tend to find it typically downslope at lower elevation. Lamb, when he was here in the 1920s, did not see this bird where we are today, right here. And he wouldn't have missed it. It's a very conspicuous bird. Today, we find this bird all over the meadow. Rock wrens clearly have moved into this area in the last hundred years and seem to be flourishing. And the question is why? In mountains around the world, a warming climate has driven many species to shift their ranges upslope and live at higher elevations than they have in the past. What's interesting about this mountain range is that um, it has been so well protected through the years that you sort of control for human alteration. You know that that hasn't changed. And so really the only explanation for why the birds have shifted might be something associated with climate. You might ask the question, why do we need to know how birds have changed over the last hundred years? Whatever did happen, there's nothing really we can do about it. And the answer to that is that it, it helps us respond to future change. 
One of the most beautiful things of this project is that we are not only generating a lot of information, but we are also generating a lot of awareness. People are getting aware of their birds and they want to protect them. That's a good challenge. <laughs> I would be absolutely delighted to know how his birds were being used in science today. These birds were sacrificed for science, um, but it's not like they just have one use. They keep feeding in to scientific discoveries as the years go by. And without that, that baseline that Lamb collected, um, we wouldn't know what was there in the past. And, and we wouldn't have anything to compare to. Their potential just increases as we go on. And if we aren't here to do this resurvey, someone down the line wouldn't be able to come back to understand how things have changed in the future.